So anyway, was, uh, cause I'm, I'm not a plumber or anything, so I just did it in sync. Hello, welcome to Castle Celluloid. Uh, I'm Kieran McNulty. This is Ryan McCann. And uh, we have a special guest this week, um, filling in for Shane Muldoon, who's sick. He got the clap. We have Martin Quigley. Hello. Uh, Shane. Yeah, I cleared up. Ah, hey, I'm, I'm glad you could join us, man. And on this 4th of July, as we film this, we decided uh, what could be more appropriate than talking about Irish movies. We're going to just get into what qualifies as Irish movies, as you know, whether it's uh, if there's a mainly Irish cast, whether it was written by an Irishman or just shot in Ireland, because generally they're not directed by Irish people. Um, I think one of the first Irish movies, technically, would have been Man of Iron. That's yeah. true. Um, is actually, was, was it named Finnerty or Flaherty? Was an, it was an Irish American director. He had made um, The Nook of the North. <laughs> yeah, was, which was huge. I mean, people don't realize how big a movie The Nook of the North was. It's quite a step down to come to Man of Iron, though, isn't it? <laughs> Get the yeah. nits! Never mind me! Get the nits! <laughs> it's a very bad film. I enjoyed it. Jesus Christ, when they killed the shark. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. impressive. I mean, like, poor shark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you feel bad for it, but Jesus Christ, these are hard men. You know, just with yeah. a couple of fucking spears in a boat. And it's a great white. They it's are. not a tiger shark with a license plate in its stomach. They it's are really hard men, but they're living on the Aran Islands, right? And those people really bug me. Because, I mean, they're always on about, you know, having services and shit like that. And they're like, okay, well, you are on the Aran Islands. I suppose it's legitimate that, you know, sometimes you wouldn't have the best of everything. But then they go on about how great it is to live on the Aran Islands. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Oh, it's an amazing place, and they're sitting on a, on a rock, like an Atlantic rock. I, I should point out that um, prior to recording, Niall was telling us to let him know whenever he sounded in any way sectarian or racist or giving out about any particular people that didn't have anything to do with movies. Um, there's one. Yeah, okay, the Irish. <laughs> we should do some of We hate the Irish. No, oh, that was the Iron Islanders, really, though. Well, there's, so a, strain, there's, there's, a, strain of, there's a strain of it now. So that... Um, Irish cinema didn't really have uh, much of a direction or much of a foothold for a long time. Um, I think the closest thing we got was through John Ford then. Because, yeah. uh, uh, again, another Irish-American who had a great love for the country. and he, In his cavalry movies, uh, would, he did a trilogy of cavalry movies. Uh, Fort Apache, Rio Grande, and she wore a yellow ribbon. She wore a yellow ribbon. I, I love all those. And in Rio Grande, there's actually there's a moment where the cavalry band, first of all, sing... I'll take you home again, Kathleen, and then sing um, the Bold Fenian Men, which and I remember talking to people in my family about that. Watching, they were watching it in like the sixties on BBC, and just thinking, how did the BBC not notice this? Yeah, <laughs> there's a rebel song glorifying the IRA. The reason uh, Ford made that cavalry trilogy was just to get funding to go to Ireland to shoot his next movie, which was The Quiet Man. The Quiet Man. Um, it was a movie that is full of um, inaccurate things about the Irish, but harmlessly so. It's a nice film, you know. What kind of an like accuracy? Like a, what kind of an accuracy? Well, it's just uh, everyone has a Dublin accent, even though it's kind of set in like the west coast of Ireland. Oh, yeah, I forgive them that. Like. You know, um, and then a, a few people don't even sound Irish at all. Uh, the Protestants and the Catholics in the village get along really well. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas um, a lot of That's Protestant people in, in the south faced a lot of trouble from local Catholics. Based on what? Hey, look, I don't want to minimise it, but like real incidents like the feathered boycott were very... I mean, name me another proper incident. Well, a lot of people... One of the first things we learned in history was um, after partition was a lot of Protestants from the south who weren't even necessarily Unionists felt the need to migrate north because of just they found themselves living in a uh, Catholic state. So uh, uh, The Quiet Man was kind of huge. Um, a lot of iconic scenes in it with John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. Anyone who's seen E.T. will remember that. Mm. Uh, it was actually based on a short story which was about a rebel, which is about um, a Fenian who's gone on the run to America and then comes back. But obviously they couldn't get away with that in the movie, so they changed it to a guy whose parents emigrated when he was a baby from this little town in Ireland and now has come back. And in order, I, I guess, to keep the dark edge from the story of um, being a killer, being a... You know, being a rebel, they, they change that he's a boxer and that he's accidentally killed someone in the ring, which doesn't have as much impact on the story as it possibly should be. It's, I mean, it sh should kind of be like the big boss, well, you know, where he's got the pendant around his neck, says, I'll, never, I'll never fight again until they rip it off. Like, Wah! and he goes crazy. <laughs> the John Wayne thing, where in he doesn't want to fight anymore, and then he finally does get drawn into fighting, it, it doesn't have the impact that it. 
really should because it's just kind of a fun little fight at the end and then kind of and then the movie's over you know but it is a great fight i mean it was yeah. remember for even john carpenter when he did that fight scene in the alley and they live yeah what he was referencing was quiet man he said i want to have a fight with the quiet man where it just keeps going and just you think it's exactly you, you think it's it's reached its pinnacle and then it just goes again you know it takes it to another level yeah yeah i love they live <laughs> i don't love they live really yeah you has that, that has that iconic line um, what is it? I'm here to kick ass and chew gum, and I'm all out of gum. What? I love that. Yeah, what do you mean? What? what? That's brilliant. That's hilarious. What? what? Yeah. It's not using yeah. Dukedom as well. The, uh, possibly. Possibly. Yeah. 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 Possibly. Well, there's a fucking seal of quality. Here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got problems, man. There wasn't a surge Go in nice um, in in movies in Ireland until maybe the late '80s, early '90s. Um, well, certainly in the '80s, you started to have Neil Jordan coming up. Yeah. Movies like Angel and was, was did he do Angel and Cal? I, I think, think he did yeah, yeah, the Company of Wolves. Or or one. One. Company yeah, of Wolves, yeah. which is a very pretentious werewolf movie. It's very pretentious. <laughs> uh, That's some creepy bits though. Great effects as well. Mm -hmm. Amazing effects, mm -hmm. but it's just, you know, if you, if you want a cool werewolf horror movie, that ain't it. Um, around that time, of course, towards the end of the age, you had the commitments. Maybe one. Mm -hmm. Does anyone remember what that, what that feeling was like when the commitments came out? It was like the first day, to me, even as a kid, it was like, oh wow, there's like a proper Irish movie with like proper Irish accents. The way, when they showed it in the States, they had to have subtitles on it. Yeah. Stuff. They used proper <laughs> Irish actors, really, didn't they? Exactly, yeah. They didn't. They used, uh, they used musicians. It was even better. Mm. It was fantastic. Oh, I love that film. It's so it is a great funny. movie. I mean, just uh, it's a musical, it's a comedy, it's... It's it's gritty in its in its own way as well, you know. I love when they're asking uh, or they're asking him to uh, manage the band, and it's like, "Oh, you were the first one. You were the first one on our estate to to uh, get into Frankie Goes to Hollywood, and you were the first one to realize it was shit." <laughs> <laughs> Amazing lines, you know. When when they're getting the the equipment from the guy, from like the the dodgy gangster guy. Yeah. Uh, can I sort you out with anything else? Bit of blow? No, 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 I'm all right. Well, actually, yeah. Uh, I mean, Mam always wanted one of those things that wakes you up in the morning with a cup of coffee. Yeah, with a cup of tea. Yeah, those. What? what are you on about? I, and he's like, I, I don't know why you're bothering. So music's all shite since Roy Orbison died. Yeah. <laughs> this is what you're dealing with, and this is like a young guy in his twenties, wow. a hard man in his twenties. Roy Orbison <laughs> was so cool. Roy Orbison was great, but I mean, in terms of that being the guy's god of music, <laughs> it's just, it, it said a lot about Irish culture at the time. Um, of course, we're not Ireland either. Like, it was dark in the video games. That's what I love about it, because it, it shows that shitty time. Yeah. In which we're kind of back to now. But. Well, I, I, I have watched it there about a year and a half ago, and I was saying that it was weird because it was tw 91. You know, in 20 years, we've gone so full exactly. circle coming back, right? Yeah. Like, there's that line where they ask him about when he's queuing up for his um, social, the door, you know, yeah. and it's like, um, we're in a recession. It's like, we're a terrible we're, country. Yeah, we're a terrible yeah. country, yeah. It feels much better being an unemployed musician than an unemployed pipe fitter. Yeah. <laughs> he's my favourite character in it, because he's so ridiculous. He's out in the estate playing a sax and the wee kids are looking at yeah. him and he's like, oh, I'm black and I'm proud. And the kids are just lucky. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine, imagine, imagine it's a woman's nipple. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I, have, I have been, but I'm a bit embarrassed. She's still in school. She's still in school. <laughs> um, and he talks about Kim Bassinger. Is she? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> but it's br the dude bringing cutaways to him all the way through the movie. See, whenever there's an argument or talk about you know sexiness of the music, they cut away to him, and he's just like, "That's <laughs> <laughs> brilliant." It's like R Robert Rodriguez would call the dog. Yes, yeah. you know, always have someone that you can cut away with just to make <laughs> editing a bit easier. You know, um, yeah, it's, it's a great movie. It, it kickstarted a lot of things. It definitely made uh, very funny. Roddy Doyle very filmable, and the next thing that was filmed from him. And his stable was the snapper. The snapper. 